This video is sponsored by Topps MLB Bunt. Topps Bunt is an officially licensed MLB card trading app that's currently running a medieval themed set called Parchment. My favorite card so far is this Motion Freddy Freeman. Download Topps MLB Bunt for free using my link in the description. It really hasn't been long since Tim Lincecum and Troy Tulowitzki were two of the best players in baseball, yet they feel like relics of a bygone era. They had a lot in common. They're basically the same age, both were West Coast kids who rocketed up draft boards playing college ball, and they each grew to be the faces of their respective National League West franchises. Tulowitzki and Lincecum also subverted the expectations of their position. Lincecum, with his slender frame, was generously listed at 5'11", but he's best remembered as a workhorse starting pitcher who threw absolute gas. Whereas Tulowitzki, all 6'3 and 205 pounds of him, fielded the shortstop position with the grace and poise one would expect from the generations of smaller middle infielders who played before him. Neither will be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame, but that didn't stop them from defining an era. They were so beloved that baseball fans find their sharp declines and early exits from the pro ranks hard to grapple with. Perhaps this fixation on the negative is misplaced. After all, the tale of Timmy and Tulo isn't a tragedy. It's a triumph. Troy Tulowitzki was the first to make the majors. After excelling in AA, he was rewarded with a 25-game stint in the majors to end the 2006 season. He collected his first big league hit off the seemingly ageless Oliver Perez. Even though Tulo won the race, Tim Lincecum was likely big league ready as soon as he was drafted out of the University of Washington. He spent 2006 laying waste to the lower levels of the minors. The following year, his performances became even harder to ignore. He allowed just 12 hits and one run in five AAA starts, earning a call-up. The 2007 Giants, despite finishing last in the National League West, were a media spectacle. That was the year Barry Bonds chased down the all-time home run record while in the midst of a perjury investigation. With the media's crosshairs on Bonds, Tim Lincecum's stellar rookie campaign was an afterthought. He rocked an above-average 112 ERA+, plus and struck out more than a batter per inning, but didn't place in Rookie of the Year voting. You know who did, though? Troy Tulowitzki. The Rockies shortstop set the league on fire in all facets of the game, emerging as a complete ball player at the young age of 22. His hitting stats were excellent, slashing 291, 359, 479 with 24 homers, but the glove is what separated him from his peers. Not that this was an indicator of his skill, but he quickly inserted himself into the history books by turning in an unassisted triple play that April. Rookie of the Year ended up being a two-horse race between Tulo and Ryan Braun, and the vote was fascinating. Braun outperformed Tulowitzki on offense, but there was a problem. With a sense of hindsight, we can look at the defensive run saved leaderboard and find something truly disturbing. Tulo tied with Albert Pujols with an absolutely massive 31 run save versus the average shortstop, whereas Braun finished dead last with negative 32 runs at third base. So even before adjusting for Tulowitzki's more demanding position, his defense was worth over 60 more runs than Braun's. Not a defensive run save fan? Fielding percentage buried Braun as well. His 895 fielding percentage was the second worst by a defender since the dead ball era. This culminated in 6.8 baseball reference wins above replacement for Tulowitzki and only two for Braun, but Braun ultimately took home the prize. With a little hindsight, Troy Tulowitzki was robbed. But 2007 was defined not by Tulo versus Braun, rather the Colorado Rockies versus history. It's time for Rocktober. September 15th, 2007. Rockies are 76 and 72, four and a half games out of a wild card spot. They're out of contention, right? Wrong. They win 12 of the last 13 games on their schedule, with the only loss coming against Brandon Webb. Now they're thrust into a game 163 against Triple Crown winner Jake Peavy. Tulo gets a hit, and another one, and another one. Why not one more? This 13th inning double against Trevor Hoffman brings the game within one. Matt Holliday hits a line drive triple and the game is tied. Then, third baseman Jamie Carroll lines out to right field. Here comes Holliday for the win, and he doesn't touch home plate. Still safe, no instant replay. Rockies advance to the playoffs. NLDS against the Phillies. Utley, Rollins, Hamels, Howard, you know these guys. Swept. NLCS against the D-backs. Oh, you have Brandon Webb? Swept. Tulo makes a great play for the last out. That's 21 wins and just one loss since mid-September. 
but they win too many games too fast. With a nine game layover between the NLCS and World Series, the Rockies lose momentum and the Boston Red Sox sweep them. Still, it's a magical run that establishes Tulowitzki as one of the franchise's brightest stars. Now, in a post Barry Bonds world, it was time for Tim Lincecum to do the same with the Giants. After a lousy 2007 and the departure of Barry Bonds, the San Francisco Giants were a team lacking identity. They needed a protagonist. Who better than Tim Lincecum to fill that role? He was captivating to watch. The amount of power generated by Lincecum's slight frame seemed impossible. The powerful contortions of his body resulted in an upper 90s fastball. It's no wonder they called him the freak. And the freak show he put on the mound was every bit effective as it was aesthetically pleasing. One of his many career highlights was a 15 strikeout performance against the Pittsburgh Pirates. For two years, 2008 and 2009, the man was unstoppable. He led Major League Baseball in basically every important pitching statistic and naturally took home two Cy Young awards for his efforts. In doing so, he joined Sandy Koufax, Greg Maddox, and Randy Johnson as the only National Leaguers to win the award in back-to-back -back seasons. The feat has since been replicated by Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, and Jacob deGrom. In that time frame, he established himself as a superstar on the national stage. Lincecum carried himself like a West Coast skater guy, not an elite professional athlete, and he was ultimately embraced for his disarming demeanor. Whether it was a Sports Illustrated magazine cover or a classic This Is Sports Center ad, big time Timmy Jim had rapidly ascended into industry royalty. When this stretch began in the spring of 2008, Pablo Sandoval and Madison Bumgarner weren't big leaguers, and Buster Posey was yet to be drafted. By the time Lincecum accepted his second Cy Young Award in 2009, the Giants still weren't quite a playoff team, but they were close. Troy Tulowitzki's 2008 wasn't so dominant. He endured trips to the disabled list for quad and hand injuries, and the start of his 2009 campaign wasn't particularly auspicious, as he struggled at the plate. And then, it was as if a switch was flipped. He laid waste to the National League from June onwards. On August 10th, he even hit for the cycle against the Chicago Cubs. His final numbers improved on his 2007 rookie campaign, and while he did finish 5th in MVP voting, accolades were hard to come by. No gold glove, no silver slugger. The Rockies lost in the NLDS to a Phillies team that eventually won the World Series. It was Tulo's last playoff appearance for Colorado, as they began to fade, making way for Tim Lincecum's Giants in the National League West. Tim Lincecum didn't win the Cy Young Award in 2010, but he was still great. He led the National League in strikeouts for a third consecutive season. But much more importantly, he set the tone for a period of playoff success. The franchise opened the NLDS by striking out 14 Braves in a two-hit complete game shutout. It was one of the most dominant playoff starts in the history of the game. By game score, it was comparable to Roy Halladay's no-hitter, Don Larson's perfect game, and Bob Gibson's 17 strikeouts. And why not? He struck out 14 without allowing a single runner to advance beyond second base. It was a strong start, but the big finish wasn't bad either. A few weeks later, he pitched eight innings of one-run ball against the Rangers, setting the table for Brian Wilson to close out this series for good. It was the Giants' first World Series win in 54 years, and Lincecum, with multiple Cy Young awards and a World Series ring, had seemingly won everything there was to win by the age of 26. At the same time, Tulowitzki started getting serious recognition. He kept the momentum of his 2009 campaign by basically repeating the season a couple more times. The difference was that the accolades started pouring in, as he finally got a pair of gold gloves, silver sluggers, and trips to the All-Star game. In that three-year stretch, he established himself as the perfect modern shortstop. Even when adjusting for the Coors effect with OPS+, Plus, his 133 was the best among shortstops. Meanwhile, Tulo trailed only Brendan Ryan in defensive runs saved. He could do it all. But on May 30th, 2012, he came up lame on a ground out. He underwent season-ending groin surgery. Lincecum's 2012 was a bummer as well. For the first time since his rookie year, he failed to reach 200 innings and 200 strikeouts, but his inflated ERA was probably the most concerning thing. With each successful Giants postseason run, his role diminished. In 2010, he was the ace. In 2012, he was relegated to long relief, where he ultimately excelled. 
By 2014, he made just one low leverage appearance. Meanwhile, Tulo averaged just 88 games a season from 2012 to 2014. When he played, he was still brilliant, but his presence on the field was no guarantee. Rather than detail a litany of bad Lincecum seasons and unfortunate Tulowitzki injuries, let's switch gears. Timmy and Tula were outliers in many ways, but especially in terms of their God-given frames. Let's talk about the body. When Troy Tulowitzki made his Major League debut in 2006, his size was an outlier. At 6 foot 3 inches tall, the only everyday shortstop with his height was the one he idolized growing up, Derek Jeter. Some of the premier shortstops in the National League included the diminutive Jimmy Rollins, David Eckstein, and Omar Vizquel. Tulo didn't look like them. Listed quite generously at 5 foot 11, 170 pounds, Tim Lincecum's size was also uncommon. In fact, of the 61 qualified pitchers in 2019, Sonny Gray, Mike Leake, and Marcus Stroman were the only hurlers under 6 feet tall. Since 2000, the single-season strikeouts by shorties are dominated by two names, Tim Lincecum and Pedro Martinez. Johnny Cueto and Titanic Tantalizing make appearances as well, but it's safe to say that they have completely different builds, whereas Lincecum and Martinez were quite similar. If you line them up next to each other, one would think that Timmy was the slick defender at shortstop and Tulo was the ace pitcher. Heck, at a photo day with Toronto, Tulowitzki actually was once mistaken for a member of the starting rotation and asked to do all kinds of pitcher poses. He obliged. Like Pedro Martinez, Lincecum relied on perfect yet violent mechanics to generate high velocity from his small frame. Lincecum's arm speed in particular was out of this world, as was the amount of torque generated by his hips. Compared to Lincecum, someone like Justin Verlander uses his longer levers to make an upper 90s fastball look nice and easy. Even though hip injuries tainted the latter half of his career, it's hard to call Lincecum's mechanics anything short of a massive success. They propelled him to consecutive Cy Young awards after all. As for Tulowitzki, the only shortstops with more five war seasons before age 30 were Archie Vaughn, Cal Ripken Jr., and Alex Rodriguez. This is great company for Tulo in particular, as he continued a lineage of big-bodied shortstops that started with Ripken and A-Rod. In a post tulowitzki league, that lineage is as strong as ever, with Seeger, Bogarts, Tatis, and Correa dominating the position. Even Tulowitzki's heir, Trevor Story, is built similarly. Tim Lincecum and Troy Tulowitzki were unique athletes worth celebrating, but it's not always easy to talk about them. The rise and fall of so-and-so. What happened to Player X? This type of rhetoric is the result of our unfair obsession with career trajectory. Instead of fixating on that, here's just 20 seconds about their steep declines. Tulowitzki was traded to Toronto, where he continued to suffer injuries to his lower half. He missed the entirety of the 2018 season, joined the Yankees, hit one home run for them, got hurt, and retired. Lincecum's freak velocity declined throughout his career, and a hip injury ended his final season in San Francisco prematurely. He joined the Angels partway through 2016, but wasn't very good. Lincecum last pitched in the Rangers minor league system in 2018. Even in these post-peak years, they provided memorable moments. Lincecum's two no-hitters came well after his best seasons, and Tulowitzki hit three playoff homers as a Blue Jay. Tulo's best season was also injury-shortened. Back in 2014 with the Rockies, he played just 91 games, but he OPSed over 1,000 and accrued war at a Mike Trout pace. It's the most recent season in which a position player received MVP votes with fewer than 400 plate appearances, thanks to Lucas Apostolaris of Baseball Prospectus for help on that one. Perceptions of Timmy and Tulo's careers are colored by a certain Cooperstown centricity. Great baseball players are ultimately sorted into two bins. You're either a Hall of Famer or not. Lincecum and Tulowitzki will likely never get a Cooperstown plaque. Lincecum has fewer career wins than Ubaldo Jimenez, and Tulowitzki has fewer hits than Eric Ibar. But Timmy and Tulo's presences are still felt throughout the museum, as well as in the echoes of baseball history. Among other things, the caps worn by Lincecum during his no-hitters are on display, and Troy Tulowitzki bobbleheads are housed in the museum's collections. To watch Timmy and Tulo at their best was nothing short of a privilege for Giants and Rockies fans. And with the trajectories they took, they certainly left us clamoring for more. 
For us, their careers were brief periods of dominance. For them, it was 13 and 15 years of the professional baseball grind. So instead of asking what happened or what could have been, maybe we should just be thankful for what it was. This episode of Baseball Bits was brought to you by Topps MLB Bunt. Topps MLB Bunt is a baseball card app that allows you to rip open packs featuring your favorite players, as well as trade with baseball fans around the world. The app gives out constant freebies. You can spin the wheel multiple times a day to win guaranteed prizes, finish a collection, and you'll also unlock a special reward card. Topps is currently running a unique set called Parchment, and it's only available through October 2nd. In addition to the Freddie Freeman I mentioned, I also pulled this super rare Luis Robert red autograph. You can install Topps MLB Bunt using my link in the description. Take care.